everyone. Um, my name's Rachi, we're a singer. And I have a cold. <laughs> so um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, right, so I'm the senior managing partner uh, in the UK public sector. Um, and when I received confirmation that uh, I was being asked to do this, I cast my mind back uh, to a report that, um, that I was very excited about when I read it. Um, it's called City of Newport on the Rise. It was written in uh, February, I think, 2014, and it has been the inspiration for uh, this talk. So, um, in terms of its recommendations to the Welsh Government, um, it talked about the creation of an innovation company, the extension of business rate relief ar around digital, the creation of a national centre for cyber security, establishment of a software university, and under infrastructure, it said, to really make Newport a digital ecosystem, the city should position itself as a test bed for digital public services. In my view, this is a paper calling for Newport to become a smart city. So based on this inspiration, I've adapted a speech given by one of my colleagues in research, Bettina Tratz ryan and this speech was given in the, on the 18th of May at the UN uh, in Geneva about smart cities. Uh, and in this presentation, I, I asked three questions um, inspired by uh, on the rise, by the On the Rise report. Um, how can the city of the future uh, become an economic knowledge center? What opportunities does the city of, of the future bring to its citizens? And how should policymakers um, and local authorities make decisions? But before I get into that, a bit about myself, a bit about my company uh, that I work for. I work for Gartner. We do a bit of research. Um, I think we're the world's largest uh, research and advisory company. Um, and in terms of um, what I do personally, I lead the UK public sector digital best practice, which uh, is uh, Gartner's consulting services. Um, we do benchmarks, uh, benchmarks analytics, and we also do digital best practice. It's about advising uh, senior people around how to make use of this stuff technology. So, <clears throat> in Sorry, I'm just going to move on. Um, in our view, digital is disruptive. And if I give a bit of background about myself, um, I was uh, part of the original dot-com uh, interesting bubble. Um, I was a CTO at one point. Uh, I was a co-founder of a consultancy around that time. But really now is the time when we are seeing a true blurring of the physical lines uh, between... Um, the physical and the digital worlds. And di the digitalization of things is everywhere. I've just recently come back from a holiday, even though you wouldn't believe it with my voice, in Sri Lanka, um, a, a city called Gaul. Um, I was in a small villa, uh, and the owner, the manager of the, of, of the villa said, do you mind if we make a video whilst we're, um, you know, whilst you're here? And I said, no, no problem, because they're planning to put that on their website. Um, I got introduced to the filmmaker, uh, who immediately linked him with me, uh, and then um, about half an hour later, I saw a drone flying past as it took a shot of the beach, followed by the villa and us sort of mucking around in the pool. So, you know, this stuff digital really is here, and things are everywhere. And, <clears throat> you know, the reason why that manager came to me uh, and asked me about uh, if, if they could have my permission, was he was focused on my, you know, me as a customer. So the customer experience was really key. Um, and, and that, in my view, is changing behavior. So it's actually the convergence, okay, of many different things. It's about people, it's about business, as much as it is about things. Uh, and in my view, it is changing behavior and expectations, not just of, of, uh, of citizens, 
um, so not just of end users, but of citizens and what they expect of public services. And I'm linking back now to the, to the report. So <clears throat> if I go to this report uh, that was presented uh, at the UN, um, think of your favorite city, uh, city. Think of a place that you visited recently. It may, it may not be Sri Lanka, it, may, it might be somewhere else. But did you enjoy that? And think of the things that, that allowed you to enjoy that. Did you feel welcome? Did you feel safe? Did you feel like you wanted to do business there? Because, um, okay, sorry. And now think of a city that you visited that you didn't like. How did that make you feel? What were the things about that that you didn't enjoy? Was it the traffic? Was it the fact that you couldn't go from, a, from one side of the city to another? Um, did you want, would you like to do business in that city? This is really my point of view around digital cities. Um, cities with good stories will attract people. Um, it will attract business investment. Um, and it's a demographic shift uh, which will trigger social and people innovation. Uh, I've got a picture here of, of, um, uh, of, of, your, of your typical th story that you, might, that you might imagine around stuff like TripAdvisor and stuff like that, but I think it's far deeper and far wider than that. Um, and technology these days, in my view, is one of those key underlying catalysts. Um, the Internet of Things, social business, uh, and analytics, uh, these technology and people factors create a formula for a future city. Uh, and this is accelerated by large clusters of customers. So, <clears throat> in terms of uh, the, the, the report from the city of Newport, its intent is to become, in my view, an economic, dig um, economic knowledge center. Um, and as per the title of this presentation, connecting the previously unconnected, bringing large customers, uh, sorry, clusters of consumers together around commerce, around knowledge, around connectivity, that is the basis for a smart city. And I've got an example of this. Sorry, sorry, these are the questions I'm asking, and that's my first one. <clears throat> I've got an example of this. So Transport for London, uh, which is one of my cl clients, when they created, I don't know whether you've been there recently, but you've got free Wi-Fi uh, in the stations. Um, they created that for the Olympics. But there's been some amazing sort of transformations that have, that have been enabled as a consequence or as, a, as, a, as an additional benefit from this that goes way beyond uh, just uh, allowing passengers to connect up as part of the Olympics. Um, if you've heard of it, Fit for the Future Stations is a program. Um, it, it is controversial in that the unions aren't that happy with it, but it is about creating a city of the future. Um, it's about removing ticket offices, and it's making use of this connectivity. Um, it's mo and, I, and I quote directly from uh, Transport for London, moving services out from behind the glass into the ticket halls. Rem and and this, is a pro this is essentially removing admin and increasing staff at, at the sort of face and, uh, of, of where the passenger, in effect, the customer is. It's actually removing 19% of the cost base as well in terms of doing that. So this is a huge secondary benefit. Uh, around this stuff, digital, around this stuff, technology. And, uh, and what this also creates is actually more secondary benefit. So the other thing that TfL is aware of and they are developing is an increased knowledge of their passengers. So this is, if you think about it in the smart city context, it's local knowledge that is being developed through this information that's being gathered by this technology. Um, and that will allow services to be tailored to the local demographics. This is true customer insight. So TfL will know much more about passengers 
than questionnaires we'll be able to provide for them. You know, for a 150-year-old business, they'll now know the density on a platform in terms of where the passengers are. They'll now know favoured journey patterns and other things I can't really mention right now. But, uh, you know, that is huge benefit from this stuff, technology. Um, and an another additional benefit of knowledge uh, applied to this is it shortens time to market. So local knowledge, and there is an implication around open data as part of that, um, allows, uh, let's say, the entrepreneur, uh, the local pr service provider, the, lo the public services, to better target their customer, to market direct to their customer, because they know the segments. They know and understand the local market. And this local affinity, this creates loyalty. And this also drives up revenues uh, in, the, in the context of a city through business rates. So this local knowledge creates opportunities for smart citizens and local authorities alike. So one of my, my, my second question is, well, what are these opportunities? So in order to answer that, let's, 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 let's tackle it in a different way. Let's look at the growth of the Internet of Things over the next five years. In uh, November 2014, my colleagues in Gartner Research um, sort of forward projected over the next five years what the growth will look like in, in terms of Internet of Technology, uh, sorry, uh, Internet of Things. Uh, by the way, this is endpoints, it's not revenue, so there is, you need to think about that. But in terms of endpoints, they will grow at 35% compound annual growth rate um, between 2013 and 2020. And this chart shows seven smart city categories, um, and more than half are consumer or citizen-driven applications. By the way, automotive, if anyone asks, is, a, is an entirely separate sort of area in, in Gartner research. So it's not included in part of the smart city de uh, definitions. So in 2020, um, smart home and smart commercial building categories are forecast to represent 45% uh, and 35% of the entire um, smart city market. Smart transport, 6.6, .6, and utilities is 7%. But essentially, um, you know, to, just trying to say it very quickly, we're talking about 10 billion endpoints in five years. Oh, that, that, that just blows my, my mind, frankly. Um, so, okay, what's the point about this? You know, where are these opportunities? Well, it's really about the data that they will then create. Um, if you combine the Internet of Things with local knowledge, um, that will create specific, localized, invaluable insight, information, essentially, to guide entrepreneurs, to guide innovators, and if you're looking to set up a smart city, to be the foundation of, of how you want to move things going forwards. I have, an, I have an example of this. It's, it, it, it is about applying data and information. Um, I, I'm also uh, a member of something called NEMODE, which is a research council fund into research into new economic digital models. That's, that's a sort of a part-time thing I do. Um, and one of my colleagues there uh, recently gave a, um, a presentation, a, a special interest group that I run, um, and his name is Dr. David Plans, and he is part of something called BioBeats. So um, I describe him as a social digital entrepreneur. Um, essentially, um, he had a vision to help people manage their health and stress uh, by merging, um, essentially, heartbeat uh, with music. And based on the heartbeat and your heart rate, it'll then play you music and essentially calm you, but at the same time, it will take your data. It, it openly admits it will take your data. And what they did, and, and what this shows, is 
that um, in a very small period of time, when, when he was at a conference, um, he took 45,000 uh, data points. He then merged it with some other data, uh, which happened to be US obesity. And there was a huge correlation between all of this. And really what that means is that BioBeat data now, along with other data sets in addition to what I've just said, they can now predict the health of individuals. So they're combining this information, they're combining this data. BioBeats is now going to have an invaluable set of information that, let's say, the insurance companies are going to be after. So that is opportunity in itself. Hopefully that's an example there I can show you. So my final question, and we're doing for time, is how should policymakers and local authorities make decisions? So, <clears throat> okay, I have a point of view here, really, uh, and my point of view is that a lot of this stuff looks really complicated and, and frankly, a little bit scary, in that, you know, the typical types of questions that, that policymakers may be asked to, let's say, provide funding for, are things that really cross boundaries. Okay, how do we make traffic, uh, how do we better direct traffic is, is one example, but it does cross a number of different boundaries. Should patients be able to FaceTime their consultants? That, that, that definitely crosses many, many different boundaries. Should we use Wi-Fi on lampposts to subsidize free school meals? There's huge amounts of things in there that stakeholders, sorry, that, that decision makers are going to have to deal with. So how can they make those decisions better? Because it seems to me that there is a bit of a bottleneck there and there is a risk associated, well, with, with senior decision makers around making decisions and whether or not they're making, they're betting against the right things. And in my view, the challenge is not the technology. The focus typically is around this stuff, this digital platforms, these things, these interfaces, these tools. It's less about the processes and capabilities and is definitely not about the ability to what I would call embrace change. By the way, that's not a picture of the, of the decision makers, I'm just saying it, it represents those people who are able to make decisions, okay, the ability to embrace change. So that's the area that I think needs more focus and that's my final bit, if I'm allowed to. Uh, to, to go through. So if I, get, if I go through an example, um, let, let's take uh, care delivery. So um, when someone's faced with let's do a digital thing, um, they may come across something like an um, you know, intensive care unit and say, right, let's, let's uh, improve those processes. Well, what we'll do is we'll move things from being paper-based to doing stuff on the tablet. Unfortunately, it's still the same work. It doesn't really change that much. It's not really addressing what needs to happen. A better way of thinking about it is that actually this stuff technology can remove manual processes and it can provide alerts. It doesn't have to have the nurses running up and down looking at individual things and re-putting data just into screens. So essentially the results are better patient, patient outcomes, but you've got to think in a different way. And those decision makers need to be able to do that. Well, how, do we, how do we make that clear to them? How do we explain that? Essentially, by looking at certain things, um, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, these guys were able to focus on the outcomes. But there is, a, there is something I think that would be quite, quite interesting uh, for us to try, for, to go through. Uh, and that is the concept of try, harvest, amplify, and challenge. Why do I go on about this? Well, in my view, business process re-engineering has not really delivered. Lean and continuous improvement um, is limited, especially if you're doing the wrong thing. Um, it just makes you really good at doing the wrong thing. So this is a sort of framework that I think uh, that takes advantage of the stuff like Edward Demings, if, you've, if you're into him. Um, and it um, sort of encourages innovation from the bottom up. Um, if, you, if you've ever read um, Switch, Chip and Dan Heath, it, it's about um, it, making sure the elephant itself can, can change and move. 
So this is my the second from final slide, really, uh, and this is a summary of it. And it, it's about a continuum from being able to be creative um, through to cementing things and standardizing processes. And it's about trying, okay? And this, this also supports an agile practice approach. Um, uh, and really it's about then harvesting those things that have been tried and seem to go well. It's then about encouraging those things that have been creative and been proven and moving them into standard approaches and practices. And then it's making sure you challenge those things that are standard to make sure that they can be done better. And that's really it, really, in, in, in terms of my mini message around this. So it's about, in my view, a new mindset. So what I've gone through in this very short period of time, hopefully I'm on time here, um, is that I've gone through, I've, I've, I've been inspired by the Newport report. I've said that is a smart city sort of uh, recipe. So what are the things we're going to do about it? How can we make the, the city of the future become an economic knowledge centre? What are the opportunities that this can then bring uh, to its citizens? And how should policymakers go about doing things? And my answer has been by creating a local economy based on knowledge centres. Um, you can uh, create clusters of information and that can provide the basis for innovation and an approach that allows organisations to be creative, that allows organisations to challenge the standard is a way of doing this and it helps those, let's say, senior stakeholders make those decisions. Thank you very much.